presento y ya te dejo hablar, ¿vale? Ok, so, hello again, everybody. Uh, we are going to start this round table uh, and I'm going to pass the mic to Tony Navarro, who will be moderating this amazing session. Thanks. Gracias. Sí. Vale. Eh, bueno, bienvenidas a la segunda jornada del Deciding Fest, eh, un espacio para la discusión pública que este año se dedica a las relaciones entre tecnología, ecología y democracia. Eh, antes de la pausa para la comida, Ana Valdivia impartió una charla sobre eh, los eh, procesos extractivos de la industria de la inteligencia artificial a lo largo de toda su cadena de, de, de suministro. Eh, ofreciendo un diagnóstico de las cosas ambientales, de los sistemas algorítmicos y de las tecnologías eh, digitales. En esta mesa redonda eh, discutiremos algunas estrategias para el rediseño de las tecnologías, especialmente de las tecnologías digitales y de los centros de datos, eh, pero también para el rediseño de las ciudades, entendidas como infraestructuras analógicas eh, que son intervenidas y transformadas mediante el urbanismo y la arquitectura, y el rediseño de nuestras relaciones políticas con los animales no humanos en vistas a relaciones eh, más deseables eh, en términos interespecie. El objetivo de estas estrategias es facilitar la transición hacia futuros alternativos eh, cuyos objetivos, horizontes, instituciones y deseos serán discutidos en la última eh, conversación entre Eugenio Morozov y Frederick Lordon. Eh, Todas estas intervenciones, así como la estructura basada en el mapeo o el diagnóstico del presente, la propuesta de un futuro alternativo y las transiciones de, de uno a otro, eh, van a ser recogidas en un libro cuyo título es Planear la salida, horizontes ecosociales, voy a asegurarme de que no lo esté citando mal, eh, horizontes ecosociales en el capital oceno, coeditado por Antonio Calleja López y por Ecaich Cancela y eh, publicado por Verso Libros, en una edición en castellano y otra en, en catalán que ya se encuentra en preventa. Eh, para tratar el tema de las transiciones ecosociales, contamos con Fike Janssen, eh, Gemma Barricarte y con Clemens Driesen. Fike es coinvestigadora principal en el Laboratorio de Infraestructura Crítica, bueno, de Critical Infrastructure Lab de la Universidad de Ámsterdam, donde lidera el área ambiental sobre enfoques de escasez para la gobernanza de centros de datos. También es codirectora de la Coalición de Justicia Climática y Derechos Digitales eh, del Green Screen. Esto creo que ha sido un problema con la traducción de... Bueno, eh, antes de trabajar en medio ambiente e infraestructura, Fique trabajó como investigadora, crítica tecnológica y formadora en la intersección de los derechos humanos y la tecnología. Eh, tiene un doctorado de la Universidad de Cardiff y su, en su investigación analizó las implicaciones sociales e institucionales de la vigilancia basada en datos. Antes de su doctorado, trabajó en Tactical Tech e eh, Hibos en datos, privacidad, seguridad digital y derechos humanos. Eh, su interés por la relación entre la inteligencia artificial y el medio ambiente comenzó durante su beca Mochila y está interesada principalmente en comprender los nuevos espacios, las áreas grises y las dinámicas cambiantes que la tecnología trae al mundo. Eh, Gemma es... Perdón, Gemma. No worry. Son las dos semes que confunden. Ya. Yeah. Bueno, Gemma es arquitecta eh, hereje. Sí. Arquitecta Eje, eh, investigadora y artista, eh, forma parte del grupo de investigación Estética Fósil del Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, el CSIC, y está especializada en ecología política urbana. Eh, ha estado involucrada en el activismo medioambiental, ha publicado numerosos artículos en revistas científicas y ha impartido cursos en conferencias en instituciones como el Centro de Cultura Contemporánea de Barcelona, eh, Media Lab Matadero o el Museo Nacional y Centro de Arte Reina Sofía. Y sus líneas de investigación y producción abordan la ecología política, eh, la ciudad, el cuerpo moderno y las dimensiones afectivas y estéticas de la energía. Eh, por último, Clemens es eh, geógrafo y filósofo cultural más que humano eh, de la Universidad de Wageningen, Sí, en Países Bajos y a menudo en colaboración con artistas, investigadores, diseñadores, agricultores y a veces, eh, si así lo desean, también con otros animales, estudia nuevas formas de comprender e intervenir significativamente en las relaciones entre múltiples especies. Eh, después de centrarse eh, anteriormente en cerdos, vacas, robots, carne cultivada y diversas aves, ahora trabaja con abejorros y castores. Su trabajo profundiza en las geografías morales que rodean estos temas y se basa en varios enfoques para explorar las complejas conexiones entre los humanos y el medio ambiente. El perfil académico de Clemens incluye una eh, formación diversa que incorpora disciplinas como la filosofía, la geografía y eh, los estudios de la ciencia y la tecnología. 
Su investigación en Wageningen eh, refleja su gran interés en las formas en que los animales, las plantas y los humanos interactúan dentro de paisajes tecnológicos, arrojando luz sobre las intrincadas relaciones que dan forma a sus vidas. Eh, así que, sin más dilación, doy paso a Fique. Uh, thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, oh, yeah, my slides are here. Um, so my name is Fika, and uh, thanks for the introduction. I think what's in, what is maybe the most important part is that uh, my day job is that I work at the university, where I do research primarily because I'm a postdoc. And I started the Critical Infrastructure Lab together with uh, two colleagues and friends where we research uh, internet and telecommunication infrastructures. And that as uh, I have multiple side projects and they are all in the civic realm. So I push uh, climate justice and digital rights coalition globally for civil society, indigenous activists uh, to come together and strategize around these topics. And um, I'm going to talk, this talk is a bit different than I normally give. I'm going to talk a bit about my own process, about sort of this transformation, about uh, first critiquing, because this is what we do both in civil society and academia. We're very good at identifying the problem and critiquing it, but also how can we move from critiquing to what are then the things that we do want? What are our yeses? How do we move forward from there? And that has also been sort of an experiment in the lab. Um, so I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about work, my work on data centers, but that's one of my main research areas. So also later on, if you have questions on data centers, you can find me in the, in the corridor. Um, so first, uh, positioning this talk, uh, as I mentioned with uh, two uh, colleagues and friends, Nielsen Ufer and Maxigas, we set up the Critical Infrastructure Lab uh, to, on the one hand, study power and conflict in uh, how these become embedded in infrastructure, but also then how do they shape society. Uh, and as I said, we were a bit tired of only critiquing, so uh, we also said how can we then co-develop infrastructural futures that center people and planet over profit and capital? Where everything is now on profit and capital, what happens if we start centering other values in it, and what, is, what sort of avenues does that open up? Uh, and I look at the uh, sort of the environmental lens. Uh, there's work on geopolitics and standards happening too. Um, that's not me. So um, as a research approach in the environment part, uh, I look at data centers. We're going to look at submarine cables. But we really see this as governance spaces. The materiality of uh, internet infrastructures are really uh, sort of governance spaces. And my interest is really about how are then the problems and the solutions defined in these governance spaces, whether it's the IETF, so the Internet Engineering Task Force, where they set the rules on how routing happens on the internet, to, for instance, the European Union, and more specifically, what is missing from these debates. Uh, and I am a social scientist, so I do a lot of interviewing, document analysis, things like this. But we've also been starting to do some making things. So uh, can we co-develop with other people, with civil society, with other groups, sort of like what it is that we do want. Uh, but we're also getting into some more speculative stuff where from January we're going to do an experiment if we can uh, create mud batteries. So can we create electricity from mud and power something from the internet? And what does it mean if it's not always on what are the challenges we run of against. So I think um, the starting point is that uh, we're running up against our social and planetary boundaries. And uh, if we continue the way we're going, which is most likely happening, uh, these limits will be overshot. And that in itself is a problem. But what the result of it is that there will be more ecological crisis and more social injustice uh, across the world in countries, uh, in regions. And why I call them ecological crisis is because when you talk to those in power, whether it are those who govern the internet or those in Brussels, they all focus very narrowly on carbon. And they completely ignore all the stuff, other things that are happening, from mining, production, any other sort of form of pollution is ignored. It's only about carbon. So I think it's also about what is missing from the debate is basically everything else. And so I divided this talk in maybe doing things better and doing better things. Because um, if we uh, look at how the industry is framing it, they're really uh, sort of 
especially when you look at the environment part, they're really enthusiastic and, and people who care and they want to do things better, but they never question the premise, what is actually destroying the world? Capitalism, growth, things like this. So we have doing things better, but maybe we should move to uh, doing uh, better things. So this is an image I didn't take, but this is an image uh, this was my first research project where I looked at the ITF, so it's the um, Internet Engineering Task Force. And this was an image that one of my colleagues made of the meetings, and the power went out. They meet three times a, uh, a year all in different spaces of the world, and they decide about protocols, so the language of how all of our messages go across the Internet. But the power went out. It didn't stop the meeting. Everybody continued going. <laughs> so it's also maybe a nice analogy. And uh, some of the people in this Internet Engineering Task Force, so they're all engineers, usually from companies who come together and decide on uh, how it works. Uh, and there are people who are really keen about like, sort of making improvements and making the Internet less harmful to the environment. So they set up a workshop, everybody had get set, submitted a paper, and I analyzed these papers. Like, how do they define the problem and how do they define the solution? And what was quite interesting is that actually, but the, the climate crisis is seen as the biggest problem. They also realize that there's other things, ecological devastation, there's other types of harm, but they really focus sort of on uh, the climate crisis, which in their mind relates to carbon. Uh, and then uh, they see it as a technical problem to be fixed. So uh, when you start reading their solutions, it is very much about measurement, like can we measure how much electricity we use? Can we measure how much carbon we're exhausting? But it's also about seeing it as an engineering problem. What if we sort of uh, start figuring out ways to do carbon-aware routing? So you have carbon-aware computing. That's if you have data centers all across the world. You can do the compute where there's an abundance of renewable energy. So you basically schedule the compute uh, where the sun is shining or when there's an uh, abundance of uh, wind. And so they were thinking, like, can we also do carbon aware routing? What if we put in the headers what type of energy sources they're using, we will route to where the abundance is? This leads to a lot of problems. So they're seeing it as an engineering problem, and they're really uh, starting to put like working groups together and figuring out how to do this. But what is interesting is actually that the one thing that never shows up is that maybe we should degrow what uh, Anna was talking about. Do maybe less routing or less computing. It's not only about cleaner routing or more renewable routing, but really when you start reading these papers, you can question like, what is the scale of the problem? So of the solution, is this actually the right way to address the problem? Because the problem is we're in an heading towards an ecological crisis and we're trying to optimize our way out of this. And this is sort of uh, very much the, the, the general uh, doctrine. And, it, and that uh, sort of starts also from this idea that, uh, yes, the industry is polluting, but it will help all the other industries become more greener. So in the end, when we do in an accounting spreadsheet, we can account our way out of it or optimize our way out of it. But actually, this is not the right scale to the problem because the solution should be somewhere else. So then I started thinking, okay, if these core values that are really uh, pushing this market forward are growth, this idea of infinite amount of resources, resources because sort of the internet is not material, uh, can we start flipping the script? Can we start looking from growth to scarcity? So then I went to my second research project, which was about, is about data centers. And really from this idea, can we move from values of infinite resources to sort of a reduction of resources? Can we move from abundance to limits? And so uh, I'm still doing a, a lot of uh, interviews now in the Netherlands with people in the data center um, environment. These are like people from the municipalities, the Min Ministry of Economic Affairs, people who own and operate data centers, NGOs who are like opposing it. And first I asked them, uh, well, so what are the issues? And they're like, oh, electricity use, uh, we need to decrease it, it's very expensive, blah, blah. It's also an economic problem. Uh, and uh, the other one is also that the municipality of Amsterdam said, no, it, there is a moratorium on the amount of data centers, so that's another problem. So the public opinion is also considered a problem. And then uh, when I ask them, so I flip the script and I say, okay, but if we're going to create a data center policy in Europe that's rooted in scarcity instead of sort of growth, 
what should be in there. And all of a sudden, very different propositions come up. So they talk about leveling the playing field, that we have to prioritize public use over commercial use, uh, that we have to have a state that invests more in sort of different type of computing. So all of a sudden, a lot of the actors want actually an industrial policy and very clear regulation. Which, if you, like me, have been in the internet scene for a while, it's quite interesting because before it's always been like the state, stay away, this is our terrain. And now all of a sudden when we talk about ecological issues, they're like, oh, the market will not fix it, let's find a state to get it. So it's also about sort of this, this, this flipping the script of defamiliarization when we start looking at the problem differently. What do we then do? But still, if you have seen the current discussions in the EU with the Draghi report, there will be an industrial policy, but it will do everything except stop the ecological crisis. It's all about growth, competition with the US and China, invest more and more and more. And we see this also locally where Amsterdam put a moratorium on data centers and all of a sudden two days ago I was reading in the paper that one of the biggest quantum computing centers will be built in Amsterdam. So, funded for by the European Union. So there's this, uh, this a lot of friction. Well, here's one of the data centers uh, in the Netherlands. So I think it's really also about if we then need an industrial policy, what should then be at the core of this if we don't, uh, like uh, we have a sort of um, a digital rights climate activist in Chile, Paz Peña, and she mentioned the fourth industrial revolution is a collective suicide pact. So if we don't want to continue with this collective suicide pact, what then should be included in this industrial policy? So now I move to doing things better, and I, this is why I actually brought some notes, because this is more sort of very new stuff we have been uh, discussing about, and more, um, it's a bit more, uh, uh, Speculative, let's put it like this. So we all came together to do one of these co-design workshops. And here in the environmental track, I started by asking people, can you bring something from nature, a technology of nature that you think is brilliant or inspires you? So people brought these different objects to the table. And one of the things that I realized, I did this a few times, is that actually a lot of our technology mimic nature but it stops at the extractive process. So if we look at solar powers, it mimics sort of photosynthesis, but where leaves fall down and they become compost and feed the trees, actually we just throw away our solar panels and ship them to Africa. So it stops at the extractive process and then we sort of just discard it. Similarly, like the internet is re uh, rhizomatic structures. We very mimic a lot of things in nature, but not uh, the good thing, we never close the loop. And so the question was, can we then, uh, like Reed said, go from degenerative <coughs> to regenerative? Where a lot of the work now of sustainability is happening in the green part, in the green high performance part. If we just optimize and we're greening it, we'll all be fine. And can we then slowly move from sustainable to restorative to regenerative? And these are some first ideas and there's a lot of things missing, but... Uh, it was quite interesting, and I think for this we need to reduce, restore, and regenerate. And here are some preliminary thoughts. So first I talked already about the data centers. It's also about drawing red lines. Like Anna said, do we really need this meta, meta data center for the metaverse that nobody, there's no social benefit to it. It's just destruction and the use of a lot of natural resources. Uh, can we prioritize public interest use of a lot of these data centers? If we think we already have enough, can we then redistribute how we use it? Uh, and I think extending end of life is super important. Uh, Van der Brau is a professor in the UK. He said that 20% uh, of the embodied carbon cost of a server in the data center, 20% of the carbon cost of, uh, is embodied. So it's actually in sort of the production and shipping of this hardware to a data center. And if we want to account for the, this carbon, we have to uh, extend the end of life from two to like three to five years, which is now uh, typical the use of a server in a data center, to 11 to 17 years. It's like it really f requires a fundamental shift. Um, and this is only the carbon cost. This has nothing to do with the pollution or water use that is needed to create silicon for the mining, to create lithium. It's just only about uh, carbon. For that, we only have to like uh, almost quadruple the, uh, the, the lifetime that we use our servers for. That actually requires quite a lot to actually expand that to uh, 11 to 17 years. 
But then I think if we uh, want to restore, we have to start thinking differently. And uh, at East 4S, which is an academic conference, uh, there was a really interesting presentation about bamboo bridges in Myanmar. Well, the spoiler alert is that they became concrete. But uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> what was very nice for a really long time was that in certain provinces in Myanmar, there were bamboo bridges. And uh, the local communities knew that every year, uh, the monsoon would uh, wipe away these bridges. So you can build things of steel and concrete, but that not only makes them dependent of the, on the central authority to rebuild these bridges, but it also, when they get washed away, they end up in sort of a, a natural environment and they don't decompose. Whereas if bamboo bridges wash away, they actually decompose and become part of nature again. It's really easy for local communities to rebuild them. And so uh, there's also this sense of ownership over infrastructure. And I think that's something that we don't have at the moment. So I think for the restoration, we need to have, have a sort of a keep it in the ground, say we already have enough materials on uh, above uh, uh, land, and uh, we have to figure out different ways how to engage with this, and, uh, and focus also our design of our hardware on uh, reuse and recycle. And maybe some of you who've been in the tech industry for a while are like, never gonna happen. But I wanna give you the example again of hardware and data centers is that, um, for a long time, server racks were stayed the same. They were always the same dimension. They got faster, more compute was able to happen on it. But in the end, the dimensions and what, what was in it was, uh, remained stable for a very long time. And then with artificial intelligence, you actually need more compute on a smaller surface. And they were running up against the physical limits of cooling. So they couldn't put more compute in these servers uh, without drastically changing uh, the cooling, um, how they cool the servers. And so the, uh, Facebook started the open, open compute project. And within two years, they radically changed what the hardware looked like in data centers. So two years, eh? you can change hardware. Not only uh, they took out certain things that they felt were unnecessary for AI, the, ser the, the servers became bigger, they needed different racks. Data centers who uh, put in this type of material have to prove that they have different floors because you need a bigger floor, like a stronger floors to be able to uh, take the more weight. Uh, and so in two years, we can radically redesign it so that some American dude can make more profit. And I think here we really have to uh, rethink what it is that we want. If we can do this in two years, we can also in two years make hardware that is uh, uh, recyclable, where we can actually uh, get more of the raw materials and more of, uh, out of it. So I think for this, we actually need an industrial policy that invests in sort of these types of redesign and also says, it's all fine and dandy that you want to put a, a data center on our territory, but only if they uh, uh, are if they do these type of spe uh, specifications. So you can actually start forming a stronger state and demanding sort of hardware that is uh, better for nature or in better relations with the land. Not good, but better relations with the land. And then um, I think that regeneration is really the question about how can infrastructure be in good relation with the land, because now it's in total not good relation with the land. We chuck it anywhere, there's conflicts all over the world, we open up mines uh, just to be able to uh, to sustain this. Uh, one of the data center people said, we cannot build data centers fast enough for the demand of the compute that we want as an industry. So just imagine the mushrooming of these things. Um, and uh, while we're at one of these workshops, somebody said, we spent the last 60, 60 years investing in silicon computing. The way our chips look now that Anna showed us, uh, this is really sort of the result of massive investment, both from the state, but also from commercial companies. And uh, so it's very historically determined. And then uh, one of the people in the workshop says, why can we not invest in post-silicon computing? Because we will never get a different type of computing if not somebody puts in the first step, and this will always be the state. There will be not, uh, I don't believe this, the financial markets will do this. Um, so I think we will also radically need to shift to how we think about innovation. Innovation is the, at the moment, if we look at the uh, horizon uh, Europe, for example, it's only more of the same, more of what's already happening, what the US and China are doing, but actually innovation is doing something different, looking a different way and trying to figure out new solutions to uh, existing problems. Yes. And then, um, 
and then I just want to draw one attention. Uh, I think uh, the, what Anna closed on is very important, like who decides what these regenerative infrastructures look like? Who decides what our infrastructures of the future look like? And this has to be far more democratic, and it has to be far less in sort of rooms of, of power, because then we'll just get more of the same. So I just want to draw attention, my two closing slides was uh, some of the people who really inspired a lot of this thinking is also the Compost Engineer Manifesto of Joana Veron and uh, Lucia uh, Egana, who is based here in Barcelona. Uh, the Green Web Foundation does the Branch magazine. They always put out issues a lot about speculative design. Uh, Sunjo uh, Lee is doing mud battery, so she is this artist who's trying to produce, sort of think through how can we create uh, energy in a different way. Uh, and then there's also some academic grounding for those interested uh, of where it is. Thank you. Um, pues. Pasamos ahora de las infraestructuras eh, digitales a las infraestructuras urbanas, así que Gemma. A ver. Vale. Vale. Eh, bueno, pues hola a todas y a todos. Eh, gracias por la invitación a los organizadores. Y bueno, primero quería empezar diciendo como que con esta idea con la que ha comenzado Fique, eh, creo que... O sea, de, de que, bueno, desde la ciencia solemos centrarnos o suelen centrarse en la diagnosis, ¿no? Eh, más que en la, en la dimensión propositiva y afirmativa. Yo creo que precisamente lo que la virtud que tenemos los espacios de la creación cultural y las artes y, y la arquitectura, ¿no? Es un interés propositivo eh, que precisamente busca expandir imaginarios, ¿no? Y llevarlos, materializarlos en el mundo que habitamos. Con lo cual, eh, creo que la arquitectura y el, el diseño de, de los espacios eh, tiene mucho que decir eh, en esto de la transición ecosocial, ¿no? Eh, entonces, bueno, yo quería comenzar precisamente bueno, hablando de la idea de expandir el imaginario de la ciudad, ¿no? eh, que, que involucra eh, incidir en el, en el espacio imaginario de las personas, que es importante también. Entonces, eh, para mí pensar la transición ecosocial es atravesar espacios de pulsión y tensiones muy fuertes, ¿no? como ya ha empezado a, a señalar Fique, eh, y en muchos casos son espacios visibles, muy visibles, pero en otros espacios invisibles. ¿no? El espacio es siempre un lugar mmm, de contradicciones en tanto que habitamos eh, un marco de urbanización capitalista. ¿no? Entonces, eh, esta contradicción entre el capital y la vida siempre, siempre se mueve ¿no? entre eh, un espacio destinado a la mercantilización del suelo y los procesos de expulsión social ¿no? en un mundo do dominado por sus lógicas, eh, y la necesidad de mantener la vida en el propio espacio habitado. ¿no? Entonces, a estas tensiones que ya existen en el marco de la transición ecosocial, aún le añadimos una tensión más, que es precisamente la necesidad urgente de, de la reconversión de esos espacios eh, y el contexto de un cronómetro, de una urgencia eh, de, re de reducción de emisiones y de, y de regeneración de los espacios que habitamos para hacerlos habitables, precisamente. Eh, entonces, aquí, en este, en este marco, eh, quería hilar como ciertas ideas relativas a, a la ecología, los imaginarios, eh, la estética y, y la tecnología. Eh, yo creo que no podemos pensar la transición ecosocial en, en las ciudades pensando en la ciudad como un producto, como un espacio habitado, ¿no? sino más bien creo que la ciudad, y no soy yo la única que lo dice, sino que hay como toda una tradición académica, eh, que dice que la, la ciudad es un proceso, no es un objeto. ¿no? Eh, la ciudad no es solo un conjunto como muy heterogéneo ¿no? de elementos socionaturales acumulados y cuerpos reunidos en un espacio densificado, sino que es un proceso socioespacial ¿no? cuyo funcionamiento se basa en la, en la interacción y en la, la movilidad de flujos metabólicos cada vez más amplios, cada vez que, que cada vez abarcan una escala más global, ¿no? eh, que fusionan eh, digamos, esa relación entre naturaleza y sociedad. ¿no? 
Eh, entonces, Víctor Toledo, que es bueno, una de las bases teóricas sobre las que yo me asiento, es un ecólogo mexicano eh, que planteó precisamente la idea de metabolismo urbano o metabolismo socio socioecológico para describir cómo funcionan eh, los, los sistemas vivos. ¿no? Y aquí la, la idea que quiero traer es que una ciudad eh, funciona de manera similar a un sistema vivo. Al, irga, al igual que un organismo necesita recursos como agua, alimentos, energía ¿no? y genera al mismo tiempo residuos, eh, emisiones, contaminación, etc., eh, una ciudad, para mantenerse viva, necesita también hacer uso de esos, de esos procesos. Eh, entonces, como señalaba Fique, eh, actualmente el metabolismo urbano, tal y como lo vivimos en las ciudades modernas del norte global, importante matiz, eh, es un metabolismo que está extralimitado y que ahora mismo se mantiene vivo a costa del de, eh, acaparamiento de otras tierras y recursos. ¿no? Eh, entonces, este proceso que venía describiendo de, de expansión de, del metabolismo urbano hay quienes hablan de, de este proceso como un proceso de urbanización de la naturaleza, de manera que eh, en estos procesos de desterritorialización de la ciudad, de condensación y de re, re, a ver si lo digo bien, reterritorialización eh, continua de los flujos circulatorios y metabólicos, eh, es, es un proceso que, que en el, sobre el cual hay que incidir para repensar la transición en la ciudad, ¿no? Eh, y este proceso eh, forma parte también de lo que compete a, a la labor urbanística y a la labor de la arquitectura. Eh, entonces, para mí es como un, una, un punto estratégico, un punto clave, eh, y dilucidarlos, conocerlos, rediseñarlos, repensarlos, eh, requiere eh, más espacio de atención, ¿no? por los espacios de, bueno, que, que piensan la arquitectura y el urbanismo. Y en muchos casos eh, también quizás hablar de desobedecerlos o boicotearlos. Eh, si pensamos, por ejemplo, en las economías afectivas de la ciudad ¿no? y cómo hay una cadena que conecta este mundo visible o hipervisible con este mundo invisible, podríamos pensar, por ejemplo, en los dispositivos tecnológicos ¿no? como los móviles, las pantallas… Es algo que todas sabemos, ¿no? Se basan como en el acaparamiento de minerales como el coltán eh, en espacios eh, socioecológicamente vulnerables, eh, pero esto además produce una, se una serie de desechos en el norte global que vuelven a reubicarse ¿no? en estos espacios socioecológicamente vulnerables, pero incluso… Eh, bueno, esto me lo he saltado, esto es la referencia de Víctor Toledo pero incluso se van eh, más allá de la atmósfera. Es decir, el proceso de urbanización global ha llegado a abarcar eh, el, espro, el, el espacio espacial. Hay basura espacial que compone también eh, residuos electrónicos, está compuesta por residuos electrónicos. Entonces, eh, yo creo que es como muy importante pensar en que hay un dentro y un afuera en, en la transición ecosocial. Hay un dentro y un afuera en la ciudad eh, y es importante pensar en el ciclo de vida completo, ¿no?, si queremos incidir en, en ella. Eh, y, bueno, incluso lo más aparentemente desmaterializado tiene una dimensión material, ¿no? Eh, estos monstruos, de alguna manera, metabólicos, para mí y gran parte como de mi producción artística va eh, en dirección a eso, son monstruos con los que tenemos que dialogar y a los que tenemos que mirar. Eh, entonces, bueno, en este devenir eh, infraestructural del mundo que lleva aconteciendo y desarrollándose desde básicamente la invención de la máquina de vapor, pero que se ha intensificado eh, desde los años 50, tras la Segunda Guerra Mundial, eh, nos ha llevado a una situación, como decía, de urbanización planetaria, donde esto adquiere una escala global. La idea de la escalabilidad para mí es importante eh, y nos ha llevado pues, a, a vivir la situación de cambio climático, ¿no? que no es sino un producto biopolítico de estos procesos metabólicos. Entonces, ahora, eh, yendo directamente a la idea de la transición ecosocial, estamos en una situación en la que el informe del IPCC de 2018 eh, que hace ya seis años de esto, 
eh, hablaba de que si queremos mantenernos dentro del marco de los acuerdos de París y bajo el grado y medio o los dos grados de aumento por, por encima de los niveles preindustriales, necesitamos eh, una reducción del 50%, del 50 de emisiones para 2030, es decir, en seis años, eh, y una reducción de las emisiones al 0% para 2050. Entonces, eh, aquí hay dos ideas fundamentales, la escalabilidad, la escalabilidad y la temporalidad a la hora de pensar las transiciones. ¿no? Eh, yo creo que esto nos pone en tensiones políticas muy fuertes. Eh, luego, por otro lado, eh, yo creo que la ciudad siempre se mueve entre, entre estos dos términos, ¿no? entre la contradicción y la potencia, porque es herramienta, pero es problema al mismo tiempo. ¿no? Y aquí hay una cuestión que el ecologismo no ha terminado de enfrentar, ¿no? yo vengo del activismo de la militancia ecologista, eh, que no termina de enfrentar, porque es, porque es una contradicción muy difícil, ¿no? pero es que es la dimensión de la irreversibilidad. Eh, ya hay un mundo hipertrofiado de infraestructuras, ya hay un mundo que habitamos que no podemos deshacer tan fácilmente, que tenemos que regenerar precisamente. No, eh, no podemos dejar de habitar en esta transición ecosocial nuestras infraestructuras, nuestra, nuestras ciudades. ¿no? Hay ya un espacio diseñado que obedece a unas dinámicas y a unas lógicas que son altísimamente dependientes de los combustibles fósiles. Entonces, eh, en esta doble condición ¿no? de problema y herramienta, eh, hay que atajar de alguna manera cómo, cómo habitamos esa irreversibilidad ¿no? eh, y, como decía, pensar la escalabilidad. Entonces, eh, bueno, estas cuestiones son temas que se abordan en los espacios especializados, pero yo sí que creo que deberían formar parte mucho más del espacio público, llevar o sea, estos temas de visibilizar estos metabolismos, encarar directamente el metabolismo que sostiene nuestras vidas, en tanto que persona, en personas que también habitan y son hijas de una matriz energética y de un metabolismo urbano, necesitamos visibilizar y pensar qué hay detrás de nuestra propia existencia ¿no? eh, y democratizar esos procesos. Eh, pero al mismo tiempo no fetichizar la democratización, que esto es algo que creo que ocurre en este tipo de espacios, no, no fetichizar el proceso, no centrarnos tanto en el proceso y hablar directamente de la huella material, porque democratizar un proceso no necesariamente implica ponerle límites ecológicos. Entonces, yo creo que ahí hay una tensión en la que deberíamos incidir. Eh, y, y bueno, quiero hablar como de varios... Ejemplos que se están abordando desde diferentes espacios de la academia, en la arquitectura y el diseño, que creo que precisamente bajo esta idea inciden en, en, en atacar al diseño metabólico eh, de los procesos que nos sostienen. ¿no? Uno es Kilmo, eh, que es una de las referencias que yo utilizo en mi, en mi producción artística. Eh, este señor escribió, bueno, ha escrito varios libros, pero eh, tiene uno muy interesante que se llama Empire, State and Building, donde, eh, yéndose a términos históricos, eh, analiza el proceso de construcción de todos los modos de construcción que se dan en la parcela del Empire State. Eh, es decir, se va al siglo XVIII, donde hace un análisis de cuáles fueron los circuitos extractivos y materiales con los que, que participaron de la producción de la granja que había en aquel momento, para ir viendo cómo se va dando ese proceso de producción metabólica de la arquitectura a lo largo de los diferentes años, hasta llegar al, al estado actual de esa parcela con el Empire State Building y concluir que es un proceso de expansión imperial. ¿no? Eh, entonces, desde este, esta recopilación que él hace, que luego la traslada a otros edificios icónicos como el Seagram eh, u otros, eh, él lo que propone, después de un análisis muy intensivo ¿no? de cuáles son esos circuitos extractivos que conforman la ciudad, él propone eh, que la arquitectura, que los espacios de la arquitectura diseñen ese circuito extractivo, que esto forme parte de los debates, de, de, de los debates dentro de los círculos de, de decisión proyectual ¿no? eh, y dentro de, de, de los espacios de participación en la construcción urbana. Eh, y esto me parece como bastante eh, revolucionario en el ámbito de la arquitectura porque directamente es cuestionar la idea de que la arquitectura es edificación, algo que se sigue enseñando a día de hoy en las facultades. Eh, por otro lado, eh, bueno, 
Eh, esto es un término que, que es, lo, he, lo he leído, mencionado en, al, en alguna bibliografía y que me parecía interesante. Ahora, el próximo proyecto que habrá en la Bienal de Venecia de Arquitectura del próximo año, precisamente va sobre esto, me llamó bastante la atención, que va sobre eh, esta idea de la internalización metabólica, precisamente parte de, de la condición metabólica eh, en la que vivimos, que es la externalización. ¿no? Todos estos procesos son procesos que no vemos, que son invisibles, que están externalizados en otros territorios y hay quienes proponen la idea de repensar la ciudad como un espacio eh, de reconfiguración metabólica, es decir, traer todo aquello que sostiene nuestros procesos de sostenimiento de la vida a la ciudad y hacer a las personas partícipes de ellos. ¿no? Eh, entonces, bueno, esto es algo que está empezando a desarrollarse ahora como idea y me interesará mucho, si a alguien le interesa, que esté atento a, a lo que ocurrirá a la final del año que viene, porque se, propo, se, se propondrán estrategias de diseño desde ahí, ¿no? eh, en el pabellón de España. Eh, y luego, por último, otro ejemplo que me parece también bastante provocativo y revolucionario eh, es el de la moratoria global a la construcción. Esto es un espacio de, de bueno, un taller que se hizo un curso en, en Harvard, en la Escuela de Diseño de Harvard, eh, liderado por Charlotte Malterrebartes. Después de aquí salió un libro donde se proponía la, un escenario hipotético, ¿no?, eh, haciéndose la pregunta de qué ocurriría si de pronto, inspirándose en el COVID, eh, si de pronto el mundo parase, hubiera un parón en la construcción ¿no? eh, y impugnásemos el hecho de construir. ¿no? ¿Cómo reconfiguraríamos eh, las necesidades de, de vivienda? ¿Cómo reajustaríamos las ciudades? ¿Cómo, se, ¿Cómo repensaríamos los procesos de construcción de la ciudad? ¿Cómo repensaríamos legalmente y burocráticamente eh, los, los procesos eh, de rediseño urbano. Eh, entonces, eh, me parece como una idea bastante provocativa porque directamente niega la actividad del arquitecto, del ingeniero o del, dise o del diseñador, ¿no? que está como atascada en la idea de producir y construir con el marco actual. ¿no? Eh, entonces, esta dislocación de los marcos, generar esta situación de extrañamiento, me pareció como muy interesante. Y es una pena que se restrinja a un ámbito académico. Creo que esto es otro de los retos que tenemos, sacar estas ideas de la academia y llevarlo a la praxis institucional, a espacios de experimentación, ¿no? eh, como ahora os explicaré, que ya empieza a hacerse en España, eh, y llevarlo a, bueno, a términos reales y materiales. ¿no? Eh, a la izquierda, eh, veis una imagen de una construcción que se hizo, que está ahora, aún no, creo que aún no se ha acabado, eh, que es eh, un, un proyecto de vivienda en Mallorca eh, hecho por ACA Arquitectas, que es eh, un colectivo de aquí de Barcelona, que precisamente cogía una, una, eh, una parcela donde había una escuela abandonada y en lugar de volver a repetir todo el proceso ¿no? de ciclo de vida de una construcción moderna, lo que hacían era destruir la escuela, desmantelarla, eh, a separar sus materiales, triturar los que les interesaban y reconformar el edificio desde eh, un ejercicio de minería urbana, ¿no? eh, reconfigurar materialmente lo que ya existía y eh, darle un uso distinto. En este caso es vivienda pública. Aquí no sé muy bien cómo, cómo hicieron esto de calcular a nivel legal, tienes que cumplir unos niveles de seguridad estructural, etcétera. No sé muy bien cómo lo hicieron. Normalmente, uno de los cuellos de botella que ocurren en este, en este tipo de procesos es que, como todo está estandarizado, este tipo de iniciativas solo pueden eh, ocurrir bajo la iniciativa privada. Con lo cual, el hecho de que esto sea iniciativa pública, no sé cómo se hizo. Eh, pero, bueno, me parece como un proyecto interesante. Y esto viene de una tradición que inició hace poco el IBABI, el Instituto de Vivienda Pública de Baleares, eh, hace unos años, con un proyecto que se llamaba Life Reusing Posidonia, donde eh, las imágenes de arriba a la derecha y la de abajo, que está a la izquierda del alga rubico, las viviendas estas blancas, lo que hacían era proponer vivienda pública eh, usando, eh, bueno, primero hicieron como en todo este proceso un mapa de recursos de las Islas Baleares para ver, eh, vale, para ver, acabo en dos minutos, para ver eh, cómo, de qué podían disponer eh, de, de kilómetro cero. Entonces, 
hicieron como un análisis del material de la posidonia como aislamiento térmico y, y, y bueno, y hicieron como esta construcción de vivienda pública bajo un mapeado de recursos bastante interesante. Eh, eso inició como una tradición bastante guay por la que fue premiado el IBABI eh, de construcción de, bio, de vivienda pública con bioconstrucción eh, y esto es como un camino bastante guay porque lo está llevando a cabo una institución pública y es vivienda pública. Y luego abajo a la derecha veréis veis el Algarrobico, que esta historia no sé, ya es como muy archiconocida, ¿no? donde se ha iniciado un proceso de desmantelamiento, que es otra de las vías eh, en la que deberíamos pensar si queremos eh, otro paradigma ¿no? en la construcción y en la reconfiguración de la ciudad. Y ya acabo con esta slide. Eh, vale, entonces, eh, investigando como proyectos y, y ejemplos, experiencias interesantes para, para eh, esta charla en, me encontré con un término que me parece como muy apropiado, que he eh, visto que se está empezando a debatir ahora en un grupo, en una plataforma de investigación en Bruselas que se llama Maybe it's high time for a seno architecture to match, eh, que precisamente recoge el prefijo seno, eh, que significa como otredad, extrañeza, ¿no? Eh, y plantea un espacio de discusión donde pensar la arquitectura más allá del paradigma edificatorio que ya conocemos. ¿no? Entonces, ahí pues, desplegaba como una serie de ideas que creo que tienen como mucho, mucha potencia en diálogo con los espacios tecnológicos, ¿no? que puede abrir unas líneas de fuga, que pueden abrir esta idea de la senoarquitectura. ¿no? Eh, como, por ejemplo, pues una experiencia que ya conocemos muy bien aquí, que es la de Tsunami Democratic, abrir el conflicto en la ciudad, ¿no? desobedecer, abrir proceso de, de, procesos de diseño y de arquitectura desde la desobediencia al extractivismo, ¿no? abrir eh, experiencias de internalización metabólica, introducir la clase, porque siempre hay una brecha digital que es problemática ¿no? en, esta, en estos contextos, eh, y bueno, llevar a, a las instituciones eh, a extremos y a tensiones poco habituales desde eh, ideas como, pues, por ejemplo, la práctica de políticas de imaginación, ¿no? eh, llevar a los espacios institucionales formas, herramientas, talleres para hacer ejercicios de imaginación política ligados a la desobediencia, etc. Y cierro aquí eh, porque me paso un poquito. Gracias. Vamos por último con Clemens. Okay, um, thank you. Um, you know, I have to. I don't want to listen to my own translation. Uh, I guess that will be confusing. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, organizers, for having me on this uh, very fascinating panel. Um, I'm, I will be talking about animal participation because we've heard a lot of serious. Uh, challenges, um, but luckily we don't face them alone, which is one way of phrasing it perhaps. Um, my, my key message will be to say, often you hear, oh yeah, animals can't participate, we should stand up for them because they don't have a voice. And I would like to uh, make the point that they do have a voice, we just don't listen. Um, and one way of, of presenting this would be to set it up as a very dichotomous opposition between two long dead uh, French guys, uh, Descartes and Montaigne, but yeah, we'll, we'll see, just, that's just for, I don't know why I put that in, let's see. Um, so this is the, this was the central, the first phrase of the Decidim Fest that we are attending now. The climate crisis is without a doubt the greatest civilizational challenge we face as a species, and I disagree with every word of that. <laughs> Uh, but of course, in a very friendly, I'm still very happy that uh, you invited me. So, I'll, I'll, um, but and I'm, I could explain uh, how I disagree with this, but I don't have to because, like I said, there's uh, all other, all kinds of species that we face that we got into trouble and that face this situation with us, which requires us to rethink this we. Okay, so. So this one way of making this point um, will be, and I hope this guy starts moving. If I, yeah. So here we are, 
And as you know, so this is just an internet meme. Um, but what is this bear going to do in California? He, what do you think he's going to do? Yeah. Look, he's restoring modern civilization, infrastructure. You know, they, they're on board with us, right? Um, and I think internet memes, they, they, they are a way into thinking about deliberative democracy. As we all know, the internet was invented by cats to dominate the world. Um, so yeah, let's, let's live with that. Let's play with that, okay? Why did the bear put the cone in? I don't know, is it like OCD? Bear OCD, I don't know, right? But, we, and, but I think it's important, this, like it's funny in a way, but it is important to realize we don't know why this beer was doing this, right? So generally, and I think. So, um, okay, so how are they gonna participate in this kind of uh, digital type of uh, democratic decision making? Uh, well, making interfaces is crucial, right? Um, and uh, this is a, a, a project a lo very long time ago, very dubious project where we tried to uh, play video games with pigs on intensive farms. Um, one of the lessons from that for me was also that this making of interfaces is far from neutral, especially considering the conditions that you do this in, but also that the making of the interface and the thinking of what could be a way to play with pigs on a farm is a, a highly political question that actually the pigs in this case actively participate in, in this making, right, in this questioning. Okay. I, I see that I don't have everyone on board yet to this idea, but we'll get there, right? Okay, next. Yeah, so this is mostly how we look at conserving wildlife, right? They are not really in on it. It's like, oh, there's a genetic shortage in this side. We have to sedate this poor fellow and bring him to the other side, right? This is, so they're blindfolded, unconscious, so it, they're not actively on board. And then we have the question of why do we want to conserve biodiversity? Well, often in practice, this is being answered in this way, because it, we have to legally, or because they, ecosystems, provide really relevant services, and indeed this then gets uh, reduced to, oh, they store carbon, don't they, right? So they, and there's this idea of the simplified forest um, that is optimized for storing carbon. Right, it's one way of treating. Are there any other reasons why we should, we, maybe this expanded we, right? If we is not just humans, why should we, well, maybe there's moral, there's political, there's poetic reasons of liking to have other creatures around, right? Or it may be bare survival, right? Environmental defenders are being killed in many places, uh, they, they, they under, it's, it's very luxury to ask this question, like, oh wait, how much will be enough? How much, how much wildlife do we need, right? Part of this question is then also how we conserve biodiversity, right? If we, if we understand what it is, why we need it, how are we going to do it? So I'm going to talk about that a bit, and I don't, I'm not doing justice to this quote, uh, by Glissant, but the basic idea is here is that ideas have a place, have a material setting, right? They don't drop from the sky from some cloud, which we also know is, has a material reality. Okay, so what, very brief detour, now we get into the uh, French guy's territory. So this is a, a, a French garden, as you can see. Oh, I was for a minute thinking you were going to indicate you have two minutes left, but yeah, okay, um, please do if I do. Um, so this is uh, in Saint-Germain and Lai, this is a garden, and at when, just after this was built, there was a young French guy, very ambitious guy, oh, I hope this works, yeah, this is him, René Descartes. Now we know him as the bad, bo bad boy of modernism, at the time, he just finished studies, walked into this garden, and saw a scene like this. Right? You see two birds, one is singing, actually singing, right? The other one, I wonder how the translator is going to do the, uh, <laughs> sorry. Birds sing differently in, the, in different languages, you know that, right? So in that anyway. Um, so this, this one bird is singing, but then the owl on the left 
moves to the bird, turns around, and then the singing stops. Right? The owl moves away again, and then singing starts again. Right? Young Descartes looks at this and says, what's going on? Wow, this is alive. What's going on? No, this is not alive. This is a garden automaton, a, a fountain full of mechanics that creates these kind of scenes. And this was, he felt his, his fragile ego was insulted so much by being fooled by this kind of thing. That he felt, okay, from now on, whenever I see anything move, you know, and people say it's alive, it is mechanical underneath. Right? So this was a particular experience that got us, in a way, into the situation we have now. Now, he was not, uh, you know, he was kind of like a, a half a century after this French guy, uh, Michel de Montaigne, who also was, a, he was also in, in city government. He was a mayor of Bordeaux uh, at some point. Um, and he is famous for writing his essays. He's inventing the word essay, as we know it now, which means I'm trying. Right? So it's a very different way of writing. Um, it's a particular way of writing that asks questions, that think, oh, what does it do when I look at the world in this way? Right? And he, when he looks at birds, he talks about, oh, um, do they bring water and even clay without knowing that the hardness of the latter grows softer by being wet? That he's talking about swallows making these beautiful nests in his, uh, in his attic. Do they map their palace, the palace, the nest? with moss or down, without foreseeing that their tender young will lie more safe and easy. Right? So this idea of looking at these birds and thinking about what are they thinking? They're planning for a future. Right? They must have ideas in mind. He doesn't know for sure, but that doesn't prevent him from reflecting on this. Right? And then uh, bad boy again, half a century later, Descartes says, I cannot share the opinion of Montaigne and others who attribute understanding and thought to animals. No, because he was fooled in their garden, right? Okay. Doubtless, when the swallows come in, in spring, they operate like clocks, right? Okay, so clocks, fountains, mechanical, that's how we should look at nature, right? And in a way, and so well, here, you know, Michel de Montaigne would have loved the internet, right? So the, when I play with my cat, who knows if I am not a pastime to her more than she is to me? Right? So just really question, like, Am I in charge here? Is this guy fooling me? Right? It's kind of like you, you question yourself in this relationship with the non-human. Right? So there's two different traditions. <laughs> there's two different traditions. What is this? What, you know, what, what kind of future are we building in a way? Right? Are we making Cartesian object worlds for soulless mechanical causation? Or are we building montaigneous dynamic space-times brimming with life and love and creativity? Right? So there's clear options. We can vote. Let's do that later. Um, I have a couple of examples. How much time do I have? Um, oh, go, go. <laughs> okay, good. Um, good clocks out of the window. They're mechanical. Yes. Um, I have a few examples. This is one. The bird radar. All right, this is one way in which animals participate in our uh, industrial ecology. Over the past uh, decade or longer, um, in many places, especially in the Western world, uh, radars have picked up migration events. Right? So uh, radars like this, they see actually when all the birds go and migrate. And that's not on the same day every year, but there's a number of factors and they you know, so based on all this historical data, they modeled when are the birds going to fly. And that is really handy when a lot of birds run into uh, buildings that have lights or run into uh, wind turbines, right? So as part, based on this, uh, on, this, on this material, there is a uh, project that aims to shut down the wind farms the moment that the birds are predicted to migrate. In a way, that is, that is like magical. Like, okay, we realize there's a limit to, you know, what we can extract from basically the, even the wind because we have to adjust. We have to incorporate the decision-making of non-humans in our systems, right? So in a way, this is a beautiful project, but at the same time, what it also does is that it says, okay, what if, you know, you're not a normal bird, right? but you decide to go a day earlier or a day later, right? Well, what happens? Well, you... You know, you weed it out, right? So you only leave 
normal birds. And yeah, so there's a kind of like, in a way, yes, this is beautiful to, to have uh, non-human decision making somehow incorporated in your, in your planetary systems, but there's limits to this, right? We create a, we create a bit of a Cartesian, a Descartes-like bird, maybe not Montaigne's bird, right? For, for what kind of bird life are we building this? Anyway, let's continue. There's another uh, example, the fish doorbell. Um, fish, what do you think? Yeah, of course, it exists. And it, for Desidim, I think, especially interesting, what do you think, is this a very popular thing to watch? What do you think? Who would like to, you know, get your device out and go and watch stuff like this all day? Is that, is that, is that like something you would do? Well, I have good news for you, or weird news for you. Um, this is extremely popular, right? So this is uh, 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 to help fish migrate through a Dutch canal, ring the damn doorbell. So. In the migration season for fish, there's a, a particular place in the center of Utrecht where they can't cross a lock, right? They can't all the time open the door because then all the water flows out and then the canal is empty. So they, they could open it for a bit, but they, have, they don't know when, you know, there's no underwater ra radar to see when they come. So they can open it for a bit, but only, they only want to do that when there's a fish present. So they installed cameras and asked the public could you check if there's a fish? And if there's a fish, ring the doorbell, and then we'll open the door, and then they come in, right? OK, 2.7 million views uh, uh, last year, last season, from all over the world, and which is really handy, because fish migrate during the night. So it's nice if people in other time zones can check for the fish. So even people, and this is kind of crazy, but even people in Brazil there was, they mentioned specifically three countries where a lot of people tuned in, uh, the US, I think, and, and Brazil. Right? So Brazil, and this morning we saw, you know, the Amazon is dry, and there's people in Brazil opening a, a, a lock in Utrecht to let fish pass through. It. It's like, what, what are we doing? Right? But in a way, this, 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 there is a lot of public engagement, and you could say this, this type of system, you know, you help, in a way, you know, the humans performing the ecosystem service here, right? It's, it's the other way around. And um, this is a way where somehow this image is charismatic enough, or images like this, or the promise of this may be happening for you to stare at the screen like for an hour in Brazil to, to see if, you know, if you can, if you, there's, there's, I guess, the, the, the element of control, and maybe even the fish have this element of control. Okay, next one, fish elevator. Five minutes. Okay, very quickly, the fish elevator, I think I, yeah. Okay, um, different but similar projects. In a way, there's also this, uh, uh, you know, how to get fish to move across dams. You can also build an elevator where they swim in, go up, and then uh, continue. And now, to make that work, this is, it's kind of pretty, yeah? So there's an AI, uh, recognizing these fish when they uh, swim into this, so they, they, which is crazy as well. Thinking of Anna's story, right? So there's a, a village in Mexico that has no water because the fish need to be recognized going into the elevator by this kind of very data intensive, you know, yeah. But, in, well, they can cross. Um, what is interesting as well is that this, when I interviewed the maker and the inventor of this who actually sold his house to, because he believed so much in this, in this thing he wanted to build it. And then um, uh, he now has a company, has built over 70 of them already. Um, he really, really loves fish. He really cares for them. He really knows, you know, you need different speeds for different types of fish. So there's love in this very industrial, infrastructural machine but also, I asked him, okay, so but, uh, the, 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 you know, the water management authority will be very pleased because you're recognizing all these. Should we look at it one more time? So you're recognizing all these fish. So you can actually, and there's a lot of issues with invasive species. So you could actually sort them out. You can put, let them go to, into a side channel to shred them. Some, I know this kind of I got into violent fantasy. And he was like, no, 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 no. We should... We should create ecosystems in a way that they, you know, that predators of these uh, animals will come, right? But there's this option, and also that what if, what if this whole world is, this whole 
ecosystem is running on this kind of data intensive processes and someone forgets an update, right? Do we, do we then lose our ecology? Okay. Um, and this, yeah, then part of that is in this, you could say in, this, in, the, in the notion of ecosystem, and this is a great paper by Tiga Brain. The notion of ecosystem is not so innocent. There is a kind of Descartes type element to this. It is like made of functional parts. Um, it, 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 it invokes the idea of manipulation, control, optimization, right? What, how, how do we actually look at ecologies as being very minded, as learning, as constantly changing in a very active way. Now, final example before, I hope. This is in, anyone from Warsaw, Poland? No? Okay, so this is uh, the, the water inlet for drinking water in Warsaw, in the Vistula River, right? And uh, the, as you know, drinking rivers are sometimes a bit more polluted than at other times. Inside this giant device, there is, oops, there's this uh, guy, actually seven of these. And these are uh, freshwater mussels, right? And they are very, very sensitive. They are very picky and they know water quality, right? So they are put in this position where if they say, mm, I don't like this water, they close. Right? And then they close the circuit and close the whole, the whole device for three million people, the drinking water is rerouted, right? It's, it's get, gotten from the reservoir until the, 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 the clams decide again for, oh, maybe, yeah, now I like it again. Let's, let's go again. It's amazing, right? Well, in a way, what, one thing is, this, they, you could say they are just used as passive sensors, right? Well, in a way, not. Because at some point, they do need to open up, right? They, they get hungry. So they're actually balancing, they're deciding, like, Ah, oh, yeah, this, this is still quite polluted, but, you know, guy got to eat, right? And so, whatever, right? So, so they are actually in, in the center of this giant infrastructure. There's a freshwater mussel deciding on whether the water is good for you or not. Right? Another really cool feature about this, because in a way, it looks very instrumentalized, right? Okay, there they are stuck in this position, right? After six weeks, the engineer running this thing gently peels them off again, just, you know, brushes them up and brings them back to the exact place where he got them from. Right? So there is a sense of reciprocity. There is like a kind of mutual ecosystem service where the, these creatures are taken very seriously for their decision-making powers, but also sort of treated in a very benign way. Okay, uh, some conclusions animal participation, more than human democracy, how to actually run this, how to make this work in Desidim, I don't know, you have to figure it out, right? Um, but, you know, it is not just about making the right decisions, about optimizing the system. It is also about opening up to this idea of what actually is this sort of more than human world? And what if we take all kinds of creatures more seriously even if they don't put cones up straight, but just, you know, let them, what, why, why did the bear do that? Um, okay, so it, it is about the challenge of making interfaces somehow uh, that, that, that make us, a, that, that create an environment where we think a bit more like Montaigne, looking at these birds building a nest, and a bit less uh, like uh, Descartes. And with that, thank you very much. Vale, eh, pues muchas gracias. Creo que no queda tiempo para preguntas. Ah, vale. Eh, no, no queda. Si alguien quiere formular una que crea que puede ser formulada y contestada en tres minutos, eh, adelante y si no, igual. A ver, eh, yo eh, sí que. A medida que he escuchado esas intervenciones, veo que todas tienen mucho en común, porque, por ejemplo, como hemos visto también en, en la presentación de, eh, de Ana Valdivia, eh, 
las, eh, las infraestructuras digitales y los centros de datos tienen un profundo impacto en los lugares donde se, se implementan. Eh, al mismo tiempo, la ciudad está completamente atravesada y todo el espacio urbano por, eh, por todas las tecnologías de la Smart City, etc. La, la propia urbanización también ha afectado a los ecosistemas de numerosas especies eh, y a muchos proyectos de prácticas, de prácticas arquitectónicas críticas. Pienso, por ejemplo, en TAC o colectivos eh, de este tipo que trabajan... Eh, con, eh, eh, poniendo el foco en la creación de espacios de cohabitabilidad entre humanos y no humanos. Así que me eh, pregunto qué espacios de, de colaboración existentes o posibles hay para planear las transiciones eh, urbanas, tecnológicas e interespecie, eh, teniendo en cuenta que sus objetivos y sus metodologías también son bastante afines. Entiendo que es una pregunta muy general y teniendo en cuenta que yo había pedido una que se pudiera responder en tres minutos, eh, Igual, un... O sea, la pregunta es si, cuáles existen. No, o, o qué posibles espacios de colaboración hay, por ejemplo, entre el urbanismo y entre el tipo de, de desarrollo tecnológico eh, regenerativo que plantea FICE, o, eh, bueno, o también posibles ejemplos de, de planificación urbanística que incorporen el tipo de eh, política entre especies más que humana de la que ha hablado Clemens. Um, Pero como moderador tengo que preguntar algo y, y al fin se me ha venido. A ver, a mí, a mí se me ocurren cosas. Puedo empezar yo. Eh, I, do you want to talk? I can give it a try. Um, I think we have a lot of the spaces already exist, but somehow we've forgotten its role and its function. I think one is we have to uh, open up universities, democratize them open it up to different perspectives, different people, allow it to everybody to come in. I think we got so stuck in this neoliberal race to the bottom that a lot of these, these institutions that used to hopefully perform the public function uh, lost it a bit in um, their ivory towers or their city halls or different spaces. And I think these are actually the spaces where uh, we can, that we can exploit for more regenerative practices. And exploit might not be the right word, but uh, <laughs> eh, yo, yo pienso en cosas que ya se están haciendo y pienso en, en, en la parte crítica de, 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 de llevar este tipo de procesos participativos desde las instituciones como persona que ha participado en procesos participativos. <laughs> eh, pienso en un proyecto muy concreto que, que está ocurriendo en Madrid. Eh, que es un proceso muy directamente relacionado con el hormigón y con la construcción, ¿eh? pero es un ejemplo de cómo eso puede generar otra serie de, por un lado, expandir imaginarios ¿no? y, por otro lado, eh, generar una serie de dinámicas sociales incluso de eh, sustento. Hay un proyecto que ahora mismo no me acuerdo del nombre, pero la artista es Elena Lavellés, eh, que lo que ha hecho es, en, en el marco del, de Valdemín Gómez, que es la planta de, industrial de procesamiento de residuos, esa, esa planta tiene una incineradora que genera muchísimos pro, problemas en el entorno cercano. ¿Y cuál es el entorno cercano? Vallecas, eh, un barrio pues, de bajas rentas. Y eh, el entorno inmediatamente más cercano es… Eh, no me saldrá el nombre ahora. Eh, el asentamiento este informal que ahora tiene problemas de luz… Eso, la cañada real. Eh, entonces, eh, esta gente básicamente lo que recibe de, de la incineradora es toda, todas las emisiones de polvo que se van de, depositando. ¿no? Entonces, eh, lo que hizo ella, que aparte de artista es geóloga, eh, fue eh, proponer al FECIT, con una ayuda del FECIT y al, centro de, eh, institu al Instituto Eduardo Torroja del CSIC, eh, proponer explorar ese material junto con las personas que pueden hacer ese ejercicio de minería urbana, ¿no? eh, reconstruir, experimentar con nuevos materiales para la autoconstrucción. Eh, entonces, es un proceso que lleva un año, le quedan como un, un año aún para terminar de desarrollarlo, pero han, ya han creado como un prototipo bastante chulo y, además, como este prototipo con las cenizas de la incineradora, eh, resiste, le han hecho pruebas de compresión y tal, y, y tiene como una resi resistencia bastante guay. Entonces, están estudiando cómo llevarlo incluso a términos eh, similares, como escalar el problema, ¿no? llevarlo incluso a términos industriales y ver cómo se puede replicar esa práctica, por ejemplo, en todas las áreas urbanas afectadas por incineradoras. ¿no? 
Es decir, cómo rehabilitar esas condiciones es como bastante interesante eh, y estos procesos interdisciplinares donde cabe la creatividad de, de las personas que habitan esos espacios, que muchas veces conocen más, tienen más conocimiento que los propios técnicos, eh, da lugar a cosas como esta. ¿no? Y hay como, eh, por ejemplo, otro, otro proyecto que yo viví en Galicia hace unos años de eh, una especie de acuerdo que hubo entre un poblado, en una, entre un asentamiento informal en la Ría de la Coruña y diversas asociaciones de vecinos para hacer una recolección de aceite usado y vender eso eh, desde una cooperativa, se conformó una cooperativa, vender eso como biocombustible a una empresa. Bueno, hay como diferentes modos, ¿no? que desde, incluso desde los espacios artísticos y des, desde los espacios donde se pueden proponer prototipados, eh, donde se pueden generar también esos procesos. ¿no? Pero luego, por otro lado, también tener en cuenta ¿no? eh, que eso tiene una serie de límites y que hay que ser muy conscientes de ellos. Eh, pero bueno, hay experiencias. No, I would love to, but, uh, but no, I think building on this, I, I realize that a lot of the a lot of the, uh, maybe the original promise of Desi Deem, as I understand it, is also to, that, it, that this kind of digital media can bring people together and form collectives around particular, you know, people are very enthusiastic about building in a different way, or people in a particular uh, village who face uh, environmental destruction. Um, and, and so, and that may be something else than uh, a kind of, you know, at a distance, in a way, the, 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 the tendency to individualize what it means to participate rather than to see that as kind of like being collectively inspired as an addition. Pues ya estamos fuera de tiempo, así que muchas gracias a todas. Y ahora hay una pausa para... Sí, hay una pausa y luego eh, Eugenio Morozov y Frederick Lordon sobre no deseo y postsocialismo y and so on, and so on.